Okay, I'm going to be going over Revelation chapter 14 verses, I think it's 9 through 11. And I'm going to be reading excerpts from a book called The Fire That Consumes by Ed Fudge, who's one of the best Christian apologists for the conditionalist view in, in that we don't believe in an orthodox traditional hellfire interpretation. But rather, we know that Revelation is a book of symbols and, I, and hyperbole or exaggeration. And that if you're going to interpret the, um, those passages literally, then what prevents you from interpreting the entirety of Revelation literally? And if you're not willing to do that, then why do you do uh, select biased verses just to support a tradition? But now I'll be reading portions of what he says. First, we'll read the text. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torments rises forever and ever. There, are, there is no rest day or night. And then Ed points out four penal elements of punishment that um, he's going to cover about these texts. One, the wine of God's fury. Two, burning sulfur. Three, um, rising smoke. And four, no rest day or night. Let's start with the wine of God's fury. The cup of God's wrath is a well-established Old Testament symbol of divine judgment in the books of poetry, as well as prophecy. The figure points to God who mixes the drink and also to the staggering effect the potion has on those drinking it. To be handed the cup means being singled out for divine punishment, and so entails agony, terror, and fear. The cup's strength reflects the degree of God's wrath. The intensity of the punishment may also vary. For God's own people, it may be a stroke which sends them reeling, but from which they recover. For his enemies, it often ends in total and irreversible extinction. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. They drink, get drunk, and vomit, and fall to rise no more. In the end, their corpses are everywhere. They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried, but will be like refuse lying on the ground. They become a ruin and an object of horror and scorn and cursing. Such was the cup Jesus accepted from God's hand in Gethsemane, and to drink it unmixed he refused even the numbing wine offered by his murderers. He suffered torment of body and soul. More than that, he drained the cup of God's wrath, passively enduring the simultaneous extinction of his own life into total death. Because his death was neither partial nor pretense, his resurrection was God's ultimate triumph over Satan and signaled the coming annihilation of death itself. That could not be so had Jesus not experienced to the full everything that death involves. Because he accepted that cup, his people will not have to. The cup he leaves for us is a constant reminder that he has taken our place. John sees the same figure of God's cup of wrath in Revelation. Here it also includes torture and grief, but it ends in death, mourning, and famine, and in consumption by fire. While Jesus treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, an angel is already calling the birds of prey to gather for a grisly feast. The fact that divine punishment ends in total destruction and death does not minimize the terror or pain. Two of the other three figures found in Revelation um, 14, 9 through 11 suggest that same end for those who drink God's unmixed cup there. Burning sulfur. Let's move on to what that um, point means. In the Bible, the symbol derives its meaning from the annihilation of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Old Testament uses it often to signify complete and total desolation. At Sodom, God rained down burning sulfur out of the heavens, and the overthrow was so total that nothing remained next morning but dense smoke rising from the land. One of the curses of God's covenant with Israel was that the land would become a burning waste of salt and sulfur, nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing in it, so that it would be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In this passage, the people are removed from the land and not actually exterminated, but the point 
of the figure remains. From the standpoint of the land, they become as Sodom, where there is burning sulfur, there are no people. Bildad pictures the same fate for the wicked man. Fire and burning sulfur mark the place he once resided. His roots dry and his branches wither. His memory perishes from the earth. For the king of Assyria, Isaiah says, God has prepared the fires of Topheth. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of burning sulfur, sets it ablaze. This burning anger is a consuming fire as God shakes the nations in the set of destruction. Although this picture ends in consumption by fire, it includes strokes from God's punishing rod, which first strikes down and shatters. Edom's dust and land will also become burning sulfur and blazing pitch when God stretches out the measuring line of chaos and the plumb line of desolation. The same picture seen in Sodom's destruction is predicted for Gog and his hordes by Ezekiel. This is literally inconsistent with the picture that follows, where carrion birds eat the corpses and Israel salvages the spoils. But both pictures are in perfect harmony, as they proclaim a message of utter extinction. Outside the book of Revelation, there can be little question that burning sulfur signifies extinction, destruction, eradication, extermination, and annihilation. Sometimes this is explicit, sometimes it's implied, but it's always there. The Old Testament often speaks of the righteous beholding the evidence of the wicked's destruction, even though it doesn't have them gloating over their actual pain. God and the angels will witness this torment, however, as he meets it out according to the mixture of his cup. Rising smoke. That's the next point we'll be covering. Um, it's clear that these figures often overlap and that a number of Old Testament passages which mention one also mention others. Sodom, which presents the figure burning sulfur, also contributes the imagery of rising smoke. When Abraham went out the next morning, all he saw was dense rising smoke from the land, like smoke from a furnace. Nothing else remained. The blanket of smoke spoke eloquently of an annihilated city and an ungodly population who would never be seen on earth again. Isaiah uses the same picture to describe Edom's destruction. We've already looked at Isaiah 34, 9, and 10, which says that Edom's dust will become burning sulfur and her land a blazing pitch. Verse 10 adds that the fire will not be quenched night and day, and that its smoke will rise forever. The fire here is unquenchable precisely because it is not put out until it completely destroys. It consumes by night and by day. There is no relief from its burning until it's finished its work. Then the actual burning ceases, but the smoke remains. In saying the smoke will rise forever, the prophet evidently means what he describes in verses 11 um, through 15, so long as time goes on, nothing but devastation will remain at the site which once was Edom. Again, the picture of destruction by fire overlaps that of slaughter by sword. The wicked die a tormented death. The smoke reminds all onlookers that the sovereign God has the last word. That the smoke lingers forever in the air means that the judgment's effect will last forever. Let the scriptures interpret themselves. And now the last point, no rest, day or night. Um, he says that this is used in a genitive sense and, mean, and the day and night refers to the kind of time. The action described is not by nature a daytime action, nor is it a nighttime action. It happens either and both. Um, the same form of night, okay, to point, just to point out a fact, the first three figures in the passage all indicate, all either indicate or are agreeable to the idea that the suffering finally ends in total extinction, interpreted in their Old Testament context. Um, the same form of night and day used here is used in Isaiah 34.10, a context noted already for its association of burning sulfur and rising smoke. There, Edom's fire is not quenched night and day, with the same sentence concluding, its smoke will rise forever. Edom's fire would not be limited to a day shift or a night shift. It burned in the daytime and in the nighttime. But when it had consumed all that was there, it went out, and then its smoke ascended as a memorial to God's thorough destruction. 
there's no justification for lifting the figures out of their biblical context and explaining them in the light of later dogmatic developments. I'm going back to the rising smoke and pointing out something else he mentioned since there's a little bit of time. John's later vision of the fall of Babylon clearly focuses on the point at issue. A voice from heaven calls on God to balance the wicked city's glory and luxury with equal measure of torture and grief. Here's the same word and it clearly calls for conscious suffering. But after answering this prayer with plagues of death, mourning, and famine, God destroys the city with a consuming fire. Merchants and kings bewail the torment they see, but all they behold is the rising smoke of a destruction now completed. The scene evokes Abraham looking out over the sight of what had been Sodom, seeing nothing now but rising smoke.